Welcome back to our continuing interviews as a prequel to the Metabolic Health Summit 2022, which is going to be May in Santa Barbara. At Diet Doctor, we're going to be a sponsor of the Metabolic Health Summit, and we're so excited for this because it's really one of the conferences where there's some of the best researchers, the leading researchers, and some of the best ideas circulating about the role of low-carb and ketogenic diets in health, a lot of focus on brain health, but a lot of focus on health in general, and a lot of sort of practical tips on how to make it work for people. So we're very excited about that conference, and we're, I'm going to be doing interviews uh, with the speakers at the conference, but I'm fortunate enough to have some pre-interviews as well. So today we have Eric, Dr. Eric Kossoff, um, who is a professor of neurology and pediatrics, the director of the Child Neurology Residency Program, and the medical director of the Pediatric Ketogenic Diet Center, all at Johns Hopkins. And he is one of the, the leading authorities on the use of ketogenic diets for the treatment of pediatric epilepsy. And so here in this, in this interview, we're gonna talk about his areas of expertise, how he sees sort of the field of ketogenic diets for epilepsy, maybe what some of the downfalls are, the specifics of the type of diets, and much more. And then I can't wait until Metabolic Health Summit, May 2022, to interview him after his, after his talk to go into even more detail. So enjoy this, this interview with Dr. Eric Kossoff. All right, well, Dr. Kossoff, thanks so much for joining me today. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, it's it's so exciting as we're leading up to the Metabolic Health Summit in 2022, and I'm, I'm thrilled you're going to be a speaker again. You've been there a number of years, and I look forward to being able to interact with you at the conference, a live conference with people in person. It should be very exciting to go to once again. But, you know, you are one of the foremost experts right now in childhood epilepsy and ketogenic diets as a treatment for that. And what, what I find so interesting is we hear time and time again how this was the uh, sort of the initial role for ketogenic diets in healthcare to treat childhood epilepsy over a hundred years ago. And then it sort of seemed to wane in popularity with the rise of um, anti-seizure uh, drugs and medications. But now it seems to be having a bit of a, a comeback, I guess you could say, and becoming more popular. So I'm curious first to get sort of your perspective on that timeline up to kind of where we are now. Yeah. So uh, again, thanks, Brett. It's, it's great to uh, be here today. It's, it'll be great to be back at the MHS uh, in 2022. It's one of my favorite conferences to lecture at. And there's always real you know, incredible questions that people come up to the mic and ask me and, you yeah. know, that I can learn from them too about, you know, what we're doing for pediatric epilepsy. And so, yeah, as you mentioned, it's, it's um, well, we're, we're still in 2021 for a little while longer. It's December <laughs> right now. And, uh, you know, this is a, a monumental historic year for all of us in the field. It's the 100 year anniversary of the first paper written uh, in actually the Mayo Clinic Bulletin um, about the ketogenic diet uh, for epilepsy. And it's interesting if you go back in, into the history, and I'm a big fan of history, Actually, the first case series, two of the patients were adults. So even though people think it started in kids, some of the first patients were actually adults. But it sort of took off for children, I think, as a perception, maybe incorrectly, that it would be easier in, in children than adults. Um, and it sort of stuck for, for decades until now, as, as I'm sure everyone knows, it's really taking off not just in popularity for children, uh, but also adults. Uh, we have an adult diet center here at Hopkins that's booming and they're starting to pop up all over the world. Um, and really, you know, as you mentioned, it, it today, at least in my field of pediatric epilepsy, is medical mainstream. Uh, almost every major children's hospital has a ketogenic diet center now. It doesn't mean they're always using it a lot, doesn't mean we can't do better, doesn't mean it's, you know, still something that we could utilize a lot more, uh, but we've come a long way. Um, you know, getting to your, your point, it, it's had a fascinating history where for, that's about 20 years, it was one of the most popular therapies for epilepsy. There were very few drugs out there. Um, and so for children, for adults, they were starting to use it also. If you go back, some of these researchers were using it for migraine even back in the 1930s um, and really kind of thinking outside the box. And, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I wrote a paper about this uh, just a year ago. I think it's not just the new drugs coming on the market, although that absolutely had something to do with the decline of the diet in the, so the 1940s, 1950s. But I think in a good lesson for all of us, what I think was a big factor was most of the researchers either passed away, weren't mentoring younger researchers. They were writing papers by themselves, 
referencing themselves, you know, lecturing just about their own work and in their own little silos. And I think what's changed now, you know, certainly, you know, the research has gotten better. And then since the 1980s, 1990s, we have parent support groups that are incredible. The Charlie Foundation is a big one in the United States that really brought the diet to fruition in the 1990s. But I think getting back to what caused the decline, we've now come the complete opposite and saying, let's work together. Not just one hospital writing about our work, but 10 hospitals combining our research, um, working together, you know, mentoring the next generation. And, you know, one of the things I love at, at MHS is speaking to like young, new doctors, dietitians, researchers in the field, you know, that are like just out of their training, excited about low carb, excited about ketogenic diets, because that's the future. I think that's how we can prevent all of this, all of what we're doing from declining again, because it could. Yeah, that's so interesting. And of course, as your role as the um, director of the Child Neurology Residency Program, you're in charge of helping teach the future generation. And, and one of the things that's so interesting is you go on social media and there's so much controversy about ketogenic diets and you know for metabolic disease, for weight loss, for heart health, or whatever the case may be. But this seems like there's one area where there really isn't that much controversy or shouldn't be that much controversy, where it's really well established as a treatment, but yet people, sort of newcomers, new doctors, new nutritionists may not recognize that because they just see the overwhelming controversy. So think it applies to neurology and epilepsy as well. So do you agree with that statement that in, in this particular setting for epilepsy, there really should be very little controversy? Yeah, you know, I think I think you're you're right, Brett. I mean, I think, you know, I don't think the concept in neurology of using a ketogenic diet for epilepsy especially refractory epilepsy, children who failed multiple medicines, you know, that's not controversial in, in 2022. You know, people recognize it. Even if it's a center that maybe doesn't use it a lot, they'll refer. They'll say, go to a place yeah. like Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, UCLA that does a lot of it. I think that's true. I think where we still have a little work to do is like some of the sort of fringes, I guess, of my field. So, you know, could you use the diet as a first line therapy right. before medicine? There is actually some data, but there is controversy. Not everyone agrees with it. You know, there isn't like a whole lot of data yet. And so researchers, neurologists say, hey, you know, let's we should still try medicines first. I think you'll see more of that in the years to come, maybe swaying the opinion away from that. You know, I think there still is some controversy about adults, even yeah. though, again, 100 years of data. You know, I, when I talk to my adult neurology colleagues, there are neurologists who say, well, you know, how much data compared to kids? And it's certainly less. And so, you know, can adults stick to it? Can adults do it? Um, there's, you know, controversy about what kind of a role, you know, does it work? I think people will agree it does, but like, where should it fall in our treatment algorithm? That's where there's still some controversy, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've come a long way. I mean, no doubt. I mean, it's, it's exciting for all of us in the field to, to see, you know, when you give a lecture about the diet, um, there's just so much, you know, interest, you know, at a general neurology meeting, but, um, it's pretty incredible, you know, to see that, but I think we still have a long way to come. Yeah. I think that's a great perspective and, uh, where its role is for adults and kids in the algorithm of treatment and in which line uh, I right. can see how that's controversial, but emerging for sure. But, but to take a step back now, we talk about it. We talk about the diet. We talk about a keto diet. So now let's say, what is a keto diet? I just, I just listened to a sort of a popular, not nutrition and health podcast, but just like a general society and culture podcast where they were talking about the keto diet. And the way they referred to it was a four to one keto diet, as if that's the only version of a keto diet. And I'm thinking, wow, this is so misleading and so just like scratching the surface. But for treating pediatric epilepsy, that's sort of the traditional, where I think where this four to one um, for, you know, fat versus protein plus carbs, four to one keto diet came from, but that's not what's used by the majority of people today following a keto diet for health, for weight loss, for sure. diabetes management. So how does that relate then to, um, pediatric epilepsy in terms of the type of, or I should say epilepsy in general, I should stop saying pediatric, the, the type of ketogenic diet, where does the evidence stand for that four to one versus like a more mainstream modified Atkins type of keto diet? 
Yeah. So, you know, that's, it's another sort of exciting thing in our field that I think we have realized, I'd say probably in the last 20 years that, you know, the traditional classic, as you say, four to one ketogenic diet created in the 1920s absolutely is effective, but may not be the only effective way to approach it. And I think this is where, you know, a lot of us learn, have learned from others in the low carb field that you can maybe get to the same place, you know, of a nutritional ketosis uh, through other means, you know, a lower ratio classic ketogenic diet, maybe with some extra supplements, be it MCT oil, maybe these new ketone esters and salts that are coming out. Um, but even before, you know, some of those supplements came out, uh, researchers said, well, you know, what about, you know, doing an Atkins like diet, but maybe a little more strict 20 grams indefinitely, and maybe even less than that 15 or 10 grams for some children per day. And we found, you know, that was sort of some of our research that that seems to work. Yeah. There have been others that have looked at sort of, you know, a low glycemic index treatment is what they call it, sort of a almost a South Beach diet where you target glycemic index less than 55 and not worry too much about the fat or ketones. And even that in some forms of epilepsy seems to work. And mm. it's very interesting. Um, it's certainly very helpful for teenagers and adults, you know, where a four to one classic ketogenic diet, you know, could they do it? Sure. Could they maintain it for years, you know, years and years that they may require very tough, right? I mean, it's no, no yeah. surprise to any of our listeners today, how tough that could be, you know, weighing and measuring and calculating the foods is not easy for a, a busy teenager or adult. And so I think it's, it's open more questions, you know, than sort of answers, you know, and I think sometimes people get confused and they say, oh my God, there's, you know, now five different versions of the ketogenic diet we use in kids, but I think it's spectacular. I mean, it just, it gives choices, you know, more options for our families. They can pick and choose, obviously with a dietitian and neurologist helping and who may say, you know, based on the data, one may be better than the other. For some, that may be true. For some, we don't know. And then they, you know, it's certainly up to them, but I mean, our goal, you know, as a neurologist is to, you know, empower our patients, let them have some say in things, right? Let them choose what they want to do. And, you know, rather than me dictating, like, you know, we do with medicines and saying, here's your prescription, here's, here's a couple options they can do. And, you know, we switch back and forth sometimes, you know, we try one diet and, and move to the other. I mean, they all generally are low carb, high fat diets, just different variants and how we start them or kind of, uh, you know, maintain them for some, but. Um, and there's going to be likely more, I suspect, in the next 10 years is, you know, diet, mostly dietitians, you know, who are just smart, innovative and say, look, you know, in in my region, doing it this way is just much better, more likely to keep compliance up. Right. We're seeing that around the world. You know, there are certain countries in the world where they say we just don't have these products. We don't have this type of fat source. You know, what if we did a modified Atkins, but you know, use this type of soy product and this type of fat. Great. Like whatever works, you know, yeah. in, in your country. Yeah. So it's an interesting intersection between sort of the mechanism of how it works and what is just sustainable and, and reasonable for the patient to do. And, and that's what I find so interesting. Like, is it just the ketones? Is it a ketone level above a certain amount? Is it something about eating the fat maybe unrelated to the ketones? Is it just reducing the carbohydrates? You know, what, what elements have the biggest impact? And by, by researchers trying to figure that out, you can find what is the most sustainable and effective uh, mode of action and, and also potentially overcome some, some potential downfalls because, you know, four to one ketogenic diets in kids have been linked to, you know, poor growth and, you know, some selenium deficiency problems and cardiac arrhythmias and rare, but, but can happen. And, right. you know, limiting the protein in growing teenagers is a concern. So, I mean, I guess that plays into what you're saying now that we have all these various different options. Um, mm -hmm. But do, when you think about all those potential side effects that I just mentioned, do you think those are true for ketogenic diets or only for sort of like a specific subset of, of four to one type ketogenic diets? You know, it, it's, you know, as again, it's, it's often the case when I go to MHS, great questions come up. There have never really been great studies comparing the five ketogenic version of our diets for side effects. They've mostly looked at efficacy, Brett. And so yeah. the efficacy data looks relatively equal. We all believe, okay, that the lower ratio modified Atkins, low glycemic treatments 
are probably lower side effects. There's a little bit of data that suggests, you know, abnormalities to lipid values. Although even on the classic ketogenic diet, those often get better after about nine to 12 months. Most of the side effects are pretty manageable, even with the classic ketogenic diet. But, you know, you still want to try to avoid them as much as possible. And so we all believe that there's not a lot of data necessarily showing that's the case. And when families ask me, they say, you know, we want to be on a modified Atkins or a low glycemic index treatment because we want less side effects. I'm like, well, we don't really know that that's true. We still need to check your lipid profiles in your child. We still, you know, have to watch their growth. We still have to keep an eye on their weight and, you know, adjust calories if they're having any issues with their calories. Again, remember, these are these are children who are growing. You know, I want them to gain weight, you know, as opposed right. to, you know, right. differences in some other things. I mean, if they're overweight, we could try to target a little bit of weight loss as a bonus. But most of the time, I want them to grow. I want them to gain weight. And I, I get worried if they start losing weight. Um, so I, I don't necessarily bill one diet as better than the other. You're absolutely right. You know, these are you know, side effects we have to watch. This is why I have a, a great dietitian with me. Um, we see these children pretty regularly, almost every three months and keep a very close eye on their metabolic conditions. Um, I think, you know, we are working at, you know, what kind of supplements can we do to try to help avoid these side effects? And we've come a long way. Um, there are definitely, you know, vitamins we're giving more of carnitine seems to be very helpful, you know, for children who are on these diets for long periods of time. Right. Um, we use citrates to prevent kidney stones, mostly with the classic ketogenic diet. Okay. And I think as time goes on, we're, we're going to get smarter and smarter about our supplements. And I'd love to think, you know, maybe in five, 10 years, you know, we'll have a supplement to prevent all the side effects, you know, that could happen. I mean, that, I think that's a very feasible goal. Um, and that will help us convince more families and more neurologists to put these children on it if they perceive it as a therapy that has very low side effects. Yeah. Right. But, but a great point. It's not something as simple as eat more fat, reduce your carbs. You're going to be fine. I mean, this requires uh, right. specialized follow-up and very detailed monitoring and, um, and, you know, makes sense. And if you have seizures and epilepsy, you're going to know that anyway, but you, you've mentioned, you know, pediatric and adults, and there's sort of this hesitancy to apply the same concepts to adults. But let me ask you, like, how different is is a uh, epileptic brain in a kid different from an epileptic brain in an adult? I mean, I, I'd imagine the, the wiring and the treatments are still very similar, even though one's growing and one isn't. Is, is, is that how you see it? Yeah. I mean, I think in general, that's probably true. I think, you know, for the older child adolescent compared to an adult, they're relatively similar. They have yeah. a lot of similar genetic syndromes that can cause their epilepsy. Epilepsy is a very varied condition. It can be genetic traumatic. It can be, you know, idiopathic where we don't know why they have it. And we're, but we are finding more and more genes that dictate which treatment may be better. And sometimes it could be diet. Sometimes the genetics would say actually medicine would be best for this condition. Yeah. Infants are where, you know, there's a lot of differences. Right. Um, and I see a lot of infants in my practice and we know sometimes they outgrow it, which is wonderful. Uh, sometimes they can have a very severe epilepsy that, you know, we know is perhaps going to be a long-term problem for them. Um, and we may treat them a little bit differently. And as, as a cardiologist, I have to go back to the cholesterol part that you mentioned. So, yeah. you know, in, in adults, it's obviously a big deal for these hyper responders. And it's kind of a very exciting time with emerging research and emerging papers coming out. So I'm curious for you dealing with kids, how in tune are you with that field of hyper responders and what it means and how to, you know, how to maybe adjust things to uh, address rising LDL. And especially, you know, if you're talking about kids who may have elevated LDL for decades, as opposed to someone in their sixties or fifties with an elevated LDL, I'm curious how you see that concept. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is a hot topic in our field. Um, I mean, in pediatrics though, to some degree, they may only be on the diet for a couple of years. So, you know, there are definitely exceptions. So I tend to be a little less concerned, I think, than my adult epilepsy colleagues about like rising values. We, we know both in children and adults, it's actually strikingly similar what we see with, you know, the cholesterol overall and LDL kind of go up and then they kind of plateau and decrease sometimes back below baseline, even right. after 12 to 15 months, we see it in kids, we see it in adults. 
And so recognizing that we tend to be more reassuring to parents. You know, in, in my pediatric group, I have yet to start like a statin medication. On the adult side, they have occasionally, you know, if the cholesterol just keeps elevating despite some interventions. Um, but even then, it's still pretty rare that they've had to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a little more concern on the adult side about it. One of our uh, researchers on in our adult diet center, Dr. Tanya McDonald, uh, she's very interested in lipid profiles. Um, there are researchers looking at carotid distensibility to see if maybe that changes while you're on the diet. There's some evidence out of Turkey that says it does, but it's reversible and it's alterable. But even then, we don't know, does that mean anything? You know, yeah. I know cardiologists like, okay, so if, there's, if it's a little less distensible, is that risky? It sounds like it could be, but it may not be anything really clinically relevant. But, you know, people are very interested in this topic. We've had cardiologists want to work with our center and following some of these adults and saying, look, let's just, what can we do to help them stay healthy? Um, maybe it is supplements. Maybe it is changing the diet. Or, you know, maybe we just don't need to worry about it. You know, yeah. maybe we're, we're panicking for no reason when we see some of these lab values, you know. But, right. Yeah, it's it's but, a very interesting field. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a great perspective. The, the the approach you take that you know, if it's a short term thing, probably not that big of a deal, and we still don't know what it means, because when we talk about it, you know, using the ketogenic diet for weight loss or for even managing uh, blood sugar, that's easy enough to sort of measure and change the diet. With epilepsy, you got to be careful because if you change it too much, seizures come back, and and you don't yeah. want to do that. So I can see how you have to be more cautious about altering the diet and pay attention to it. So. I always have to ask about that as a cardiologist yeah, sure. always comes up, but, but look, this has been a great overview. Uh, I'm so excited to hear more about what you have to say at, at metabolic health summit in May in Santa Barbara. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good follow-up interview after your talk too, to go into maybe some other details. So thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Can't, can't wait to be there. Should be a lot of fun.